How many of you have already had lunch? I just need to know what kind of audience we're working with. I saw some people come in with boxes. How many of you have not had lunch then? All right. This is good because I want to make sure I understand. I know I am that spot on the break outside that, you know, around noon. About I got about 30 minutes before minds start to wander and go like, hey, what's for lunch? What are the options? So I will make sure I respect that time as well. Um, just excited to be here. Um, shout out to Pastor Preston and the Radiant team. Um, they have done such a great job of hosting um, already. Um, here's the thing. I'm going to warn you guys. I'm a extrovert seven on the Enneagram. I'm a big includer. Uh, for those of you watching online, I am trying, to, I'm going to do my best to stay within the confines of this table. I'm super interactive, so you guys will be getting an arm workout today. I won't have people standing up, moving around, uh, respect online and all that. So please just, uh, uh, like I said, don't be shocked. Like, oh, is this just a like intro thing? Like, no, this will be like point two, point three, point four conclusion. Like, we're going to be active, moving around, and uh, making sure that you guys are extra hungry going to lunch. Um, but like I said, my name is Phil Johnson. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a youth director out there. I've been at uh, uh, my wife and I's current church for eight years. I've been in youth ministry for 11. Best job we've ever had. We absolutely love serving in next-gen ministry. There's something special about when a student discovers who they were created to be and who God is, especially on a first-hand way. And it's something for us that we love modeling what it looks like to follow Jesus, but model them being fans of people. Because everyone has a critic, but not everybody has a fan. And we get to have that opportunity to come alongside and partner with the next generation in that. I'm also a new iPhone user. I've been an Android user for 16 years. I feel like now some will say that's a miracle. My other, like my green bubble friends, I have not forgotten you. There is still some PTSD. I can't change the bubbles to green on my iPhone yet. So I'm still trying to figure that out just to try to have like a combined spot. I am a uh, Minnesota sports soap opera fan. Um, For those of you that are sports enthusiasts, we have really bad sports teams in Minnesota. We're really good at making you like feel like, hey, we might this might be the year just to watch your heart break over and over and over again. And so, what was that? Uh, No, he's gonna well, he's gonna move the team to Seattle. So that will get really good, and then they'll move, and then it's like, oh, here we are again. The Minnesota soap opera continues, but that's where then I love eating Chick Fil A and Chipotle to help just kind of like watch that, like just, you know, comfort me, if you will. Um, so I want to do a few shout outs here today. Once again, online, if you guys can, uh, just so uh, you can interact as well, drop emoji in the comment section, all that stuff. How many of you have been in youth ministry longer than 10 years? Longer than 10 years. We got one. Okay. How many years? Dude, what's your name? Matt, can we give it up for Matt? Come on, 17, 18. Well, we might, I just might have you come up here and just share some thoughts out as well. How many of you have been in youth ministry less than two years? Less than two years, okay? How many of you have been in next-gen ministry less than one year? Less than one year? Less than six months? Less than six months? How long? Since January. Can we, what's your name? Timber. Can we just congratulate Timber? Welcome to the Next Gen Fam. Yes, oh, it's, it's a grind and it's amazing. Um, how many of you here are part-time or volunteer kids and youth coordinators? Part-time or volunteer? Part-time and volunteer. Can we give it up in the room, y'all, our heroes? I've been in youth ministry 11 years. I've served both in the volunteer role uh, and part-time role, and, and I know there's a grind to that as well. There's something to be said about working the jobs you work and then to step in those those areas um, as well in that capacity, that it takes a lot. And I do believe that there's something special God has in store for you. I want to pray for you guys at the end of the um, this session here today too because it's one of those that I, there was a powerful moment um, in the session right before we stepped in here that Pastor Lee had for those that felt like they were giving up, that they're just ready to give up. And my heart broke because I watched um, just these ministers and people that were in ministry, just you could sense the weight they were carrying through the tears and just the prayers that were happening. And one of the things that um, I really believe is like, one of the things that enemy will try to do is loosen that grip on the plow, the field that you've been called to. And one of the things that I believe that conferences, the purpose that they serve is to help strengthen the grip. It's spoken of in Isaiah, uh, a prayer that I I just really um, resonate with, with is like they would strengthen the hands of those with the hands on the plow and then strengthen their legs. For those of you that are standing in the gap for the next generation, um, man, you guys are heroes. And I love being in rooms where people smell like sheep. 
if you will. I love being in rooms around people that have the marks of being in the trenches. Because how many of you know, like when you shepherd, sheep are going to poop on you, right? The sheep are going to bite. And it's one of those things that uh, like there's a resiliency that is required when you are working in kids and youth ministry. And so uh, the purpose of this session here today is uh, just looking at what does it look like for us to position ourselves to be a future ready youth ministry, and then even with some of our kids team members in here to be future ready next gen ministry leaders. One of the things, many things I love about youth workers and kids workers is how you guys resemble just what Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. And he said, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. A common denominator that we all have online and here in this room is you guys have committed to sharing your lives with your flock. That no matter what it is that you've been walking through, that you are choosing on those Wednesday nights, those small groups, when you go to that game, when you're showing up, you get that um, late night phone call, that late night text message, the student that you've been pouring time and time into that has walked away from faith or all of a sudden started ghosting you and you're like, man, what am I doing? All that you are choosing to share your lives with them as well as past, the Apostle Paul talks about. And uh, a future ready youth ministry, um, it's one of those kind of like play-ons because you're going like, we don't really know what the future holds. But what we can do is begin to look at what are some of the trends that we're seeing? What's some of the trajectory and how do we position ourselves in such a way that we are not just reacting to everything that's going on, but there's an intentionality, uh, intentionality and a strategy, if you will, to position ourselves to shepherd the flock that we have. And so we're going to be looking into this and uh, the reality our students are future minded. Our students are moving into the future. Whether they realize it or not, whether they don't realize the ripple effects of the words that they're saying, the TikTok videos that they're making, the things that they're standing up for and they're talking about, our students are future minded and they are moving into the future. So for us, there's a responsibility we have as next gen ministers and teams to once again position our ministries in such a way that it would be able to minister and shepherd the flock that we have in the future. So one of the first challenges we have is our actions have to represent um, the knowledge that we proclaim to know about our flock. It's one thing to talk about what we know of Gen Z and shocker, Gen Alpha is right around the corner. Kids ministry has Gen Alpha in it, Youth ministry will have Gen Alpha within the next year. The first group of Gen Alpha will be in your middle school ministries. So it's a little bit of a shock here. I know some people are like, oh, what about Gen Z? What about Gen Z? Well, we're about to have a multi-generational kids and youth ministry, right? Your youth ministries, you have Gen Alpha coming in. You also now will be working with millennial parents, Right, that's like, I mean, some of you are like, I just got used to working with Xers and Boomers. Well, millennials are a lot different parents. Let me just tell you that, all right? But our actions and our strategies have to reflect the knowledge that we say we have. We see it all throughout the Bible, especially in the book of James, that it's one thing just to speak on it, to talk on it. But our game plans and our strategies, they need to reflect that which we know to be true about the flocks that we are leading. And so what I'm just going to look at here, one of the uh, things that I appreciate about conference sessions like this, uh, there's moments where I have felt overwhelmed, right? You get all these points, there's all these things, you're like, where do I start in applying this? It's like, man, I want to have a worship experience like this. I want to have a community engagement strategy like this. I want to have this youth room or these kids spaces or this, like, there's all these things, like, where do I begin? And one of the things that have been beneficial to me is leading with questions. And so really today, my, my responsibility is I want to leave you with questions for you to consider because everyone is coming from a different context. There are some here and online that are coming from multi-campus con contexts, some that are volunteer, some of that are part-time, some of that are working with a staff. Some of you, you are the staff. You are facilities. You are the curriculum. You are small group. You are all the above. And these questions are meant to help just navigate, like, how do I answer this within my context? Because then that also helps eradicate some of that spirit of comparison because you're going, this is the needs of my flock. This is what I know to be true here, and how do my strategies reflect that? So to position ourselves as a future-ready youth ministry, here are four questions and strategies I would just want to share with you once again. Um, these are ones just based off trends that we are seeing will be relevant and needed five to ten years from now. First one is, what is my student discipleship strategy? What is my student discipleship 
strategy. So a typical one, a system we might see is there's a program, right? There's a Wednesday night for those of you that meet on Wednesday nights. Uh, some of you that meet on Sunday nights or whatever night of the week you choose to meet. There's a service element usually. usually. There's a desire for small groups. There's a desire for events like camps and conventions. And, and those are good, but what we got to understand, those uh, like especially the events and services, those don't disciple students. I think there's, we can fall victim to that rut of going like, well, we had this powerful moment at the altars, and that's needed. But discipleship is the ability to walk with, to help unpack, to create a safe place where a student who has grown up in church can look at you and say, Pastor, I don't really know if I believe the Bible, what the word of God says. I feel scared to ask my parents because they're on staff. And so where do I ask these questions? We have students that are, the level of biblical illiteracy right now is alarming, right? I just had a group of students that are new, and they're like, hey, when you say like 16-3, chap- like, like what's the 16 and what's the 3? I'm like, oh, that's the chapter and the verse. They're like, oh, that's what it is, right? And, like, it's, and I think some of us are afraid to begin to dive into some of those elements of, of just really realizing where are our students at when it comes to some of that. And so discipleship, there needs to be an intentionality within that strategy. And it, discipleship, it happens up close. It's impossible to be shallow and disciple. It's impossible to remain shallow in relationships and be able to disciple effectively. We saw how Jesus modeled this all throughout the New Testament and how he got in. He, I mean, he wasn't afraid of getting into the mess, the doubts, and the fears that his disciples were walking with. I love when you dive into the text and, I mean, now like the Logos presentation last night, same thing. I feel like I don't know how many of you guys have heard that before. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Okay, now I like need to redo everything because I feel like I'm just missing some of the depths of it, but when you look at the text of what Jesus did to disciple, he has people that would have, in today's context, be from liberal, like progressive left, conservative right, people that have social media, people that don't have social media, people that were business that would take advantage of initially of those of a lesser socioeconomic spot, uh, those that were fighting to overthrow government. Like these were all the people that were a part of his group, but he created a safe environment. There was an intentionality in the discipleship. Where is that taking place within our youth ministries and kids' ministries? Where, what does that strategy look like to create a safe place to have honest conversation, to ask tough questions within that real community? Uh, discipleship can't be delegated. Discipleship cannot be delegated. It can be multiplied. It can be caught by other leaders and volunteers on your team. But it is not something that for us as leaders that we can go, that's somebody else's job. I'm going to hire that out for the larger church. It's it's like, no, discipleship needs to be a muscle that we are constantly working at when it comes to ministers of the gospel. And when we're looking at this future of where students are coming, Gen Alpha, Gen Z, there's a few things that we can, I think we can all agree on that students need when it comes to this discipleship, uh, discipleship strategy. First one is they need to experience the real Jesus in a real way. They need to experience the real Jesus in a real way. And what does that mean? It's looking at what are we doing to create some of those moments where like, hey, away from the lights, away from the big events, this is how you can experience Jesus in your room, in your car. Because I can tell you the most powerful interactions I've had were not at events. They were when I was driving in my car and I felt the Holy Spirit just begin to move in such a way just in my vehicle that I was just, I had to pull over and start breaking down crying. Those are the moments that I remember in my spiritual journey. How are we, what are we doing within the process to empower our students to experience the real Jesus in a real way? Um, what are we doing uh, for our students that, uh, to help them with the cultural discernment? What is truth? What is a lie? We are seeing, students are seeing model that they want to be affirmed rather than to know what is true. Hey, retweet, like, affirm my opinion. I don't care if it's true. Because I'm tying my identity to am I being accepted based off this opinion? How are we teaching them to navigate some of the cultural discernment of what is true, what is lie, what is the Holy Spirit, and what is emotion? And so within that discipleship strategy, third is within that is looking at meaningful relationships. Uh, We just did our typical youth relationship series, as a lot of youth ministries do every year. I was amazed to find that one of the number one questions was, how do I just have a relationship? I think I, and I've, I was like prepared to answer all the big ones about like, about sex and gender identity and all these, but the basic questions that we kept getting were, how do I just have a friendship? How do I have a relationship? 
And what does it look like for students to have meaningful relationships? Especially having youth ministry now post-COVID, as, as like the COVID ripple effects, we won't really know the effects of some of those students that have been online, distant from community, disconnected from community. So what does that look like in the discipleship strategy for them to have meaningful relationships? Another need that we see is how do they lead, uh, how do they f- carry out the mission in a countercultural environment? How do they like lead in a culture with, because like the mission of Jesus, it's countercultural. And so what does that look like? Uh, one of the biggest questions I get from students is going, hey, I believe in Jesus. I just don't know how to talk about him in a context where I would be labeled and canceled for just knowing that I'm a Christian. So I'm scared to even mention I'm a Christian, let alone talking about my faith. What are we doing within that strategy to equip them to lead in a counter-cultural environment? And then finally, um, the intentional discipleship. See, I've, for me, I felt convicted this past year. One of the things COVID exposed for me in our ministry was that we, ex- we were majoring in experiences and minoring in discipleship. That we were majoring in creating an experience that they wanted to bring their friends to, that they wanted to post online, but we were minoring in discipleship. And it was one of those things, I don't know if you guys have been there, like where we took a step back and, and our team, we just cried out and said, God, forgive us. Forgive us for those moments that we've missed, these moments and opportunities to disciple. And it's those, once again, those environments are, are helpful, but the discipleship process of getting down with them, and we have to prioritize discipleship. So that first question, what does my student's discipleship strategy look like? Second strategy to help position our youth ministries to be future ready. What does my volunteer and leader training strategy look like? Because for a youth ministry to be future ready, you have to have volunteers and leaders that are future ready. And uh, one of the number one excuses I get when we are recruiting, right, they're going, I, like either I, I don't dress like students, I don't have the, I don't know what, what they're wearing, I don't know what they're talking, is lit still a word? word? No, lit will, is not a word anymore that was a couple years ago, let's please, let's, we gotta stop using that. Um, but leaders going like, well, I don't know if I'm out of spot in my own faith journey, I don't know if I can handle all this, it's, well, I just kind of do what Jesus did, ask, ask the questions, right? But it's looking at how are we preparing them f- to uh, be the future ready leaders that our students need. And so some of the things that we have seen work, I love, I'm stealing this from Pastor Reggie Joyner and Dr. Virginia Ward down in Atlanta. They have a phenomenal template when it comes to just training volunteers and helping uh, understand who's in their flock. And so these are five questions that leaders need to be able to answer for their students. And these are ones that are a great training tool when you have volunteer leaders that are coming straight from full-time jobs that are hopping into your youth ministries that have kids that like, it almost feels like babysitting for some of the students that show up, right? The parents are like, just please take them for the next two hours. And leaders are like, I don't know what to do with them. Here's five questions that can help on that answering. The first one, do we know their name? Can we answer the question, do we know the student's name? Gen Z and Gen Alpha are the most diverse generations that we have seen, and there's something super important about being able to pronounce a student's name correctly, especially when they come from a different background than you. There's the most powerful sound a student can hear is the sound of their name being spoken correctly. There's something, and I know I fall victim to this as well, of where I'll go, what up, bro? What up, girl? Hey, dude. And like we say that, but to say their name, to get in the habit of calling them by name, because um, in, a, in a day and age where they're known by usernames, account uh, handles, to say the name, it's, it speaks value. We see that model by with Jesus and Zacchaeus, that he wasn't looking at Zacchaeus up in the tree going, hey, tax collector. It was Zacchaeus. And in that moment, it communicated value to everyone in that room. And we do that when we, we, uh, we say a student's name. So the first question is, um, do we know their name? Second, do we know what matters to them? Right, not what we think matters. I'll just assume that every student loves TikTok and assume that every student knows these certain things. But do we know what matters to our student? There is a um, a story one of my mentors she shared, and she talks about there was a student in her youth ministry that loved trains. I've yet to have a student that loves trains, but I, I'm taking lessons from her. And the student, he was 16 years old, and he was the youngest person in his train club by 40 years. <laughs> It was a group of 55 and up that they would have these meetings once a month and they would take different like assignments and recreate different parts of Minnesota. 
with, and they have their homework assignment. They take these cards and they have to build these trains in different parts of Minnesota. And then they would come back and they would put them together. And she heard that the student of hers loved trains. So she's like, well, I'm going to drive 30 minutes. I'm going to show up because you like trains and I'm a fan of you. So I'm going to show up and let me, I'm going to learn a little about trains. And so she shows up. And everybody's shocked. They're like, who is this person? She obviously does not know anything about trains. And so, and the six-year-old was so excited to see her there. And so he's like, pastor, pastor, pastor. And he's introducing her to all these older guys and these older ladies. And, and then all of a sudden, she hears this like sniffling in the background. She turns around and it's the kid's parents. And they're like, what are you doing here? And she's like, well, I heard your son loved trains. And I just wanted to see like, I just wanted to see him in his environment. It mattered to him. So then it mattered to me. And they started to, to cry as they shared the story of going like, we've just been contemplating whether or not we need to leave the church. We've been contemplating just there's so many questions we have and we just don't know if this, is, if this religion thing is for us, if this Jesus thing is for us. But what you did today, showing up like this, if that's what you're about, if that's what this Jesus is about, then, then we're gonna stay. Fast forward over 10 years later, they're now board members at this church. Planted. All because a pastor, a leader, took the time to figure out what mattered to a student. What matters to them? So what's the student's name? What matters to them? And then throw them, where do they come from? Do we know where they come from? What's their, their school background or where they're coming from? What's the home background? We're going to get to that here in, the, uh, in a little bit on the home side of things. But do we know the context of which they are coming from? I think it's very easy when it comes to, especially on a disciplinary side, that we've all had to face in a youth ministry or a kids ministry setting, that to look at the surface level and just to call out the surface part, but not take the time to dig in like, man, what's the root behind this? Where are they coming from? And to begin to take the time to understand where are they coming from. So question one, what's their name? Do they, we know their name? Do we know what matters? Do we know where they come from? Do we know what they've done? Students, uh, leaders, uh, we can empower them, equip them to answer this question. This is huge because students, and I don't know about you, I have some that will test me. They'll go, all right, you say Jesus loves me. Would he still love me if he knew that I did this? Do you still believe all those things that you prayed over me, that you said about me, even after I've made this mistake? Even after I've had these doubts? Do you still believe all that? Does Jesus still believe that, even after what I've done? And so there's something powerful, and this is where I love, like I initially started in middle school, and there's something so beautiful about middle school students that they like don't know how to fake it yet, right? It's like, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. High school, it's like they have the face, right? It's like cats and dogs. Middle school is dogs. Like, do you like me? Do you like me? High school, it's like cats. Like, I'll see if I like you. I'll see you. They're just like, oh, let's see you. What, you what, what clothes are you wearing? He's like, what, like, what, what, are you on TikTok? Oh, you're, one, you're cringy on TikTok. Oh, no, I don't know if I like you. Like, it's all these conditional elements, right? But do you know what I've done? And being able to answer that question, because and I share that because like in middle school, it's like those middle school leaders become the heroes, right? Because it's when they get into high school, they look back and they're like, you loved me even when I was annoying and I had put way too much Axe body spray, which is still a thing. That is not a just a, a previous, like that is still I think one of the worst ideas I ever had in youth ministry. I gave like little like dollar Axe body spray cans to new guests. And of course, I didn't think like, oh, they're going to use it right here, right now. <laughs> so that lasted one month. And then we got rid of that as our new guest gift at that point. But to have those middle schoolers come back and go like, even when I was at my worst, you still love me. Isn't that Jesus? as it's spoken of in Romans, that even when I was about my worst, and so there's something to be said about knowing, being able to answer that question, do you know what I've done? And finally, do you know what I'm capable of? Do you know what I'm capable of? These are five questions that we can empower leaders with that will help them be future ready. To know a student's name, to know what matters to them, to know where they come from, to know what they've done, to know what they're capable of. Uh, recently, we did a podcast exercise with students that had said, I want to do a podcast, I want to do a podcast. And we're like, all right, well, let's, let's see what that would look like. Let's just, we're not going to, we're just going to put together an exercise. And I just sat back and I listened and I was convicted and amazed all at the same time. Convicted at seeing the potential that I had failed to see in these students, but amazed at what they were capable of. And all they needed was an opportunity. And I'll be honest, be the first to say that there's a lot of you that have been burned by giving students an opportunity with a mic or a platform. I've had to get up, and there's been several times where I've had to unpack, no, that's theologically incorrect, that actually doesn't happen, that's actually not true. But do we know what students are capable of? And do we have a strategy that reflects giving them an opportunity? 
So these are five questions that we have seen that when it comes to empowering leaders to be future ready that can help with that. Um, and even when you're doing training and looking at training, there's a lot of great resources. I love what the Radiant Network is putting out. I love what Pastor Preston and Zach are doing on the youth ministry side. And there's so much around the country that's available that even if you're volunteer and part-time, there's great resources that you can share with your leaders um, and, and team. Training's done in a group. Development's done one-on-one. -on -one. Training is often done as a group. Training is the what to do and why we do it. The development is like, hey, this is, this is like the you, the developing you as a leader. And so training can be an email, short video, pick, um, just some of the things that you're seeing within your group. So the first two questions that we have, what does your discipleship, student discipleship process look like and strategy? What does your leader training strategy look like? And this next one that I think gets overlooked a lot is what does your parent partnership strategy look like? What does your parent partnership strategy look like? Um, here's some facts about parents that you guys will be ministering to here in the future. Uh, millennial parents, um, over 65% of students that come from millennial homes have both parents working. So they are seeing and seeing parents and families model where both parents are gone, but both parents are hard at work. Um, the age gap has never been wider from a parent to a student. So if you think now that, so some of the parents in the room, if you think that tech gap is large now and you're feeling it, it's going to even be larger for millennials to alpha. That, that age gap. Um, there's been a surprising rise in single fathers. 20% of fathers are single, single parents. And single moms, I mean, there's been a lot of great focus from the church to continue to come alongside single moms, but there's many students that are coming from single father homes. Um, 20, less than 25% of students are coming from traditional nuclear homes where it's a mom and dad that are married and that's their birth parents. Less than 25% of students are coming from that home. So you have to look at even like what you're talking about on a, on a Wednesday night. What's some of your strategies? Because you're going like, what's my audience? And chances are the majority is not coming from something that we think they are coming from. Less than 25% are coming from nuclear homes. 33% of millennial parents, this is all from Pew Research, 33% of millennial parents um, that have children together are not married. So you're also seeing 33% of these students are going to be coming up are seeing like, well, my mom and dad live together. What's the problem? They're not married. It's okay. And so these are some of those dynamics that when you're partnering with parents, being aware of your audience and who you're ministering to and partnering with. So three um, biblical values that we can hold to in these partnerships as we look to position youth ministries to partner with parents on a future ready side is our partnership must be rooted in God things, not just good things. Must be rooted in the God things. Now, once again, understanding our audience that some parents are like, they might not be coming from a biblical background. How can it be rooted in the God things? but yet still communicating with them in such a way that it's a partnership aspect. I love how Paul talked about this in Philippians where it's the partnership in the gospel. We get a chance to be purpose partners with parents and guardians. We have that opportunity, and that's something that we can lean in on when it comes to partnering with them. Um, there are a lot of people partnering with uh, parents and their students. You got teachers, coaches, people in AAU um, environments, all those different settings. But there's a limit to what they can do on a spiritual context. There's a limit. And that's where we as youth workers, as kids workers, we have that opportunity to step into that. And once again, that plays back to discipleship strategy. And we have an opportunity to communicate to parents, man, we care about your kid. We want to see your kid win. Do you know what that means to a parent? I'm starting to experience, I have a six and a four-year-old, and there's something so special when I see a person walk in and care more about my kid than anybody else in the room. There's something that makes me just like melt when I see my kids even forget about me and they just run to this person because they feel safe. They feel seen. They feel valued. We get to do that for parents who are on the front lines that are, might, some of them might be on their end. They might, the single parent, right? the divorced couple, we have an opportunity to step in and be purpose partners with them. The second one of this is our partnership puts us in a supporting role. It's key to know we are in a supportive role. We are not in a leading role, okay? That is the parent and the guardian side, but we are there on a supportive role. And once again, that, uh, and that connects back into, okay, these are our audience, like where are they coming from? The third one, to keep things moving here, the partnership model, we are the Aaron and her to their Moses, we are here to lift their arms up, even if they don't believe in the God that we're talking about. 
We are there to lift their arms up and support because how we do that might just be the opportunity to open the door to a conversation on faith. How we love their kids might just be the opportunity. We had a, a, a leader, I can't take any credit for this. She showed up to her, uh, this one of her small groups, soccer, a uh, girl in her small group, her soccer game. She came with a sign. She was a volunteer college student working two jobs to go through college, shows up, big old sign. And just for the sake of this context, I'm, I, I, this parent comes up. He goes, what the, and I will keep out the rest of the language he heard because I'm sitting in the background watching this all take place. And so he starts like, I'm like, do I have to step in? Like you're, this dude's cussing. But he was so shocked. Like, why are you more excited to watch my girl than me? Like, are you paid to do this? She's like, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a college student. I'm, I just, I'm such a fan of your girl. I'm such a fan of your girl. And he's sitting there. He's just so dumbfounded. He's like, what do you mean you're a fan? And so he starts quizzing her, right? And so, and this leader is so excited. She's like, oh, but, oh, your girl, she's amazing. She's been coming to Wednesday nights. And he goes, oh, that's where she's going. Okay, okay. And he's asking these questions. And finally, he goes, well, well what church are you with? What, what religious group? She's like, well, we're part of Emmanuel Christian Center, and she gives him the address. One month later, the family shows up, and the entire family's baptized. To this day, that family still sits second row during second service, all because there was a leader that was willing to partner with a family that had no idea who Jesus was. We are and have the opportunity to be the Aaron and the Hur to their Moses. What does your parent partnership strategy look like? Last one I have, last question here today. What is our community engagement strategy look like? What does it look like to engage with our community? I mean, the question that always haunts me is like, man, how does my community know that we are with them? What would our community miss if our organization, if our church was not there anymore? Would they notice we are gone? Would they notice that we weren't present um, a story I'm going to share is one not of like a, a highlight of say, hey, look at us, but it's one to speak to the intentionality that we can have when it comes to partnering with the community and the, that engagement. So eight years ago, I uh, started at Emmanuel, and um, uh, so I was trying to get into schools, and in our area, it was really hard to get into schools. There were some bad experiences with churches. Doors were closed left and right. The only doors open were private Christian schools. And for me, I had a heart. I wanted, I wanted to get the kids that are in the public setting, right? I wanted to get on the public school. And I had to mute some of my friends down south because there's like Texas high schools are different. I'm like watching them like bring pizza in the lunchroom. I'm like, oh, that'd be nice. That's, that's great. But for us, it was like I was able to get in as a garbage guy. So I would go in middle school and I would pick up garbage during lunch. And then I, I upgraded after a year. I began to be on the door patrol. Making sure, like, hey, who could go to the bathroom and who couldn't, right? It's, like, so much power. So much power in that moment. Then, after about six months, I got upgraded to lunchroom para. And I was able to walk from table to table, interact with students. I'd carry fruit snacks in my back pocket, and I'd give them riddles. So I'd always go to the troubled tables, right, that would, like, be causing most ruckus. I'm like, all right, if you get this riddle, I got fruit snacks. And they would spend all lunch trying to figure it out, right? And, and it was just little things, right? It was just like nothing life-changing. I wasn't allowed to say I'm a pastor. I was just, I was like, I'm Mr. Phil. I was just Mr. Phil walking around, right? And, and then we would, we would bless the lunchroom pairs at the end. We would do like a lunch for them, and we'd tell stories of these students and stuff like that. And after a few years, one of the middle school uh, teachers became the principal of the high school. And it was one of those that we just kept knocking the door. We just kept as, as we could. We would show up in the best ways that we could with what we were allowed to do. One year ago, there was a death of a very prom a student that was very well liked in our in that school, um, it was one of those students like peak physical condition, played multiple sports, died in a swimming accident. And there's so many questions, and there was a memorial for the student outside the school. And and as we do, and as many of you guys do, we just we just showed up. We just wanted to show support. And the principal saw me there. The principal we'd worked with for several years. He goes, "Hey, pastor, come here." And I was really shocked because he said, "Pastor," I'm like, "Whoa, I'm not used to that." <laughs> And he pulls me in and we, he brings me into the room with the kid's family and his closest friends. And, and we just begin to have this moment of just wrestling with these questions. And I walked away and I asked the principal, I said, why me? Why us? Why? why, why? Like, you have counselors and all these things. And he's like, we've watched you and your team the last seven years. You care about these kids. You don't care about your platform. You don't care about all this. And we needed the people that loved the kids most in that room today. That was after seven years. 
picking up trash, <laughs> dropping off Gatorade. No microphone time, no youth group invites. And we care about you guys. And it's been a beautiful partnership since we've hosted then the ACT classes and ACT testing at our site. And there's multiple other school things. But that came after eight years. Not eight months. Not a several years. And so I would ask you, what's your community engagement strategy? Because the people in your community, they, they need to see you present. Your students need to see you present on the campuses or in those areas. Our way to kind of see this is uh, the way that we like to model is show up physically, mentally, and randomly. Showing up physically, being on site. Because there's something that when you show up to a game, faculty sees that. Parents see that. And it's not to say, hey, look at me, I'm here. As some extroverts tend to do, we need to take a page sometimes out of the introverts books of just going like, hey, the intentionality that introverts have, I'm like, like just taking all of that advice from them. But showing up physically on campus, right? Showing that I'm present. Even if the kids just ignore you. Right? It's, there's, a pre, there's something powerful in the present of just being there. Uh, showing up mentally. Being aware of what's going on on the campuses. Small hack. Subscribe to the school newsletter. Find out, like, or subscribe to the school calendar. What's going on? Low-hanging fruit. Teacher, uh, teacher conferences. Can I tell you? Teachers are not pumped about teacher conferences. All right? What would it look like to bring dinner, to drop off snacks, to bring coffee that morning? Right? Little things like that. Can I tell you? Restaurants and local uh, businesses love partnering with schools, right? Those are easy wins, connecting the dots. Hey, Chick-fil-A, we want to bless the teachers. National appreciation or teacher appreciation is today. You know, we want to just bring breakfast to all the teachers. What, what can we do? How can we make that happen? Showing up mentally, being aware of what's going on, and then showing up randomly. That's those big moments, Right? Hey, you, book fair, I know that none of you guys want to set up. Hey, we're going to bring a team of volunteers and we're going to set up the book fair for you. Why? Man, we just, we love that you care about this next generation. We just, we just want to come alongside of you. There was a story I loved, a uh, friend of mine pastored in Pennsylvania. There was a church that partnered so much with the school that the, the school district, this is a true story, they had, when they would bring in new teachers, they had to let new teachers know when they came to this one school to say, hey, don't compare this school to any other school. They're like, why? They're like, yes, it's nicer. Yes, it has all those things, but it's because a church is partnering with them. That it became so noticeable, the difference of the impact of a church in an educational community. That they had to, in all teacher intros, had to let these new teachers know in education that this is because of a church. This is because of a church. And one of our things that we have to look at, what does our engagement strategy with our community look like in the future? So as I get ready to wrap up here and just open up for some questions and then try to break some pastoral stereotypes and end a little early for you guys on the lunch side, um, what does the next five to ten years know, uh, hold? Only God really knows. But what we can expect, there's going to be change. There's going to be change. There's going to be disruption. There's going to be, like, once again, we don't really know the ripple effects of COVID, um, generation Alpha, it's been interesting to watch some of the cultural markers that they're placing on this generation. Uh, politics has been a major bullet point for this generation coming up. They've seen households and friendships divided over politics. There's been a highlighting of failure that's almost been glamorized. There's a fear this is the most entrepreneurial generation, Gen Z and, and Alpha, but they are the most risk averse. They don't have that Rocky movie, right? They don't have the example of how to get back up. Isn't it a resilient generation? But what does that look like for us to be future ready to begin to call that resilience out? To begin to pray that God would just use them in such a way to change just their surroundings. For us, we must, we got to remain flexible. I love Pastor Wayne Cadero. He used to pastor in Grand Rapids. He had the quote, blessed are the flexible for when they bend, they shall not break. Blessed are the flexible for when they bend, they shall not break. It's remaining flexible. And really what that looks like, it's leading with an open hand and an open heart. The open heart saying, God, what you want to do. God, what you desire. And the open hand of saying, like, how can I give this to students? How can I continue to empower them? How can I continue to multiply other disciples? What does that look like? And so for us, when it comes to all of this, the leading with an open hand and leading with an open heart. And what I just want to do here, I want to close in prayer. Um, because I think for us here in the room, we care about students. We care about the next generation. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. 
you're going to be taking time out of your schedule to come to a conference, to sit in a breakout session, to listen to some things you're like, I already knew that. Yep. Listen, if I can, if what you don't do, if that leads you to something you will do, great. Like, I'm not here to just share, like, hey, do all this stuff. But it, even if you're like, that idea, that stinks. Hopefully, it leads you to a good idea then. Then this is a beneficial breakout. <laughs> but for us, I think my, my prayer as I was praying this morning for this group, that God, we don't need the credit. God, we don't want the credit. We don't need it. Because you can inspire from a platform, but you develop from the background. God, we don't need the credit. We just want you to have the glory. God, we want you to have a generation that knows you, that knows who they are in you. Because everybody has a critic, but not everybody has a fan. And what would it look like for a generation five to ten years from now that knows Jesus? And is helping others to know him as well. Because for those of you that have kids in this room, the generation you're leading just might be the teachers for your children. They just might be the coaches. So I'm going I'm to close with this point, and then I'm going I'm to pray, and I'm going to open up, I'll have Pastor Preston come up, and we can do some Q&A. As we leave here today, let's, let's take the challenge. Let's do something for our students that someone has done for us. Do something for a student you wish someone would have done for you. And do something for a student that you hope someone does for your student one day. Heavenly Father, God, I, I'm just grateful. Lord, for each and every member representing this room, from kids to youth, young adults, volunteer, part-time to full-time. God, we just, we give you glory in this moment, God for what you have done, Lord. We just don't look to what has not yet happened, but Lord God, we are full of faith as we look ahead to the future. And God, may we not be full of fear. God, I pray right now for each and every volunteer and leader and pastor in this room, God, that as they have been so faithful, Lord, to where they are, God, I pray that as is spoken of in your word, that God, you would refresh those who refresh others. God, I pray for a fresh outpouring of your spirit, God. Even right now in this moment, Lord God, even in this, the moments of worship to come in the other breakouts, Lord God, I pray for a spirit of refreshing, Lord God, a time of refreshing, God. Lord, we pray for the new ideas, God, to begin to, to stir up, God. Lord, even right now, I pray against the spirit of comparison. God, I pray against the spirit that will come and rob us of the joy of what we get to do. God, I pray against that spirit that would rob us of the joy of the salvation we have in you. Lord God, I pray that in this next season, Lord, I pray that there will be a new excitement, Lord, as we begin to see what you are doing and what you are capable of, Lord God. We pray for new depth, Lord, in our students, God. We pray for a new commitment to discipleship, Lord God, to empowering leaders, to partnering with parents, to engaging in our community, Lord God. Lord, I pray from this room, Lord, we, that there would be these God-sized dreams that have been on the shelf collecting dust, God, that would be picked back up and begin to be applied, Lord God. And we just pray that we would see that ripple effect that would come from the Midwest here, Lord God, that would stretch all throughout the country, Lord God, and not for the glory of a church, but the glory of heaven, and that we would see your kingdom advance, Lord God. Lord, I pray for wisdom as we are diving into the hurting and broken realities that our students are living in. God, I pray for our protection against empathy fatigue. God, I pray for our protection against that compassion fatigue that would drain us, Lord God, that as we are feeling that weight, Lord, that, Lord, that we would not try to do this on our own strengths, but, God, that there would be a partnership with the Holy Spirit, that understanding that, God, that which you have placed us, where you have placed us, what we are doing, Lord God, it is impossible without you. And, God, I pray that there be a new commitment to our devotion to you in this season a new devotion to prayer, a devotion to being students of your word, of God, even for us vocalizing our own faith and not just from a platform or a microphone, but God, even in our, our daily lives, God, how we treat our own friends, God, how we lead our relationships in our life, God, we pray that we would model that mission that you have called us to. 
And God, even right now, I pray a special blessing on Pastor Preston and the team here at Radiant. Lord God, um, as they are hosting and opening up their doors to so many of us who are here today, God, I pray a blessing on this church. Lord God, as it has been an anchor to the community, Lord God, that Lord, that there has, it's, they are a wellspring, Lord God, of encouragement, God, for those that are on the journey. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless them and their ministry, Lord God. I pray for Pastor Lee and the team here, Lord God, even the remaining portions of this conference, Lord God. God, you are just just getting started, and we pray, Lord God, that uh, this phrase, the best is yet to come, it is not just a catchphrase, but it is a belief that the blessings are not just behind us, but the blessings are still ahead of us. And so, God, we cling to that, and we believe that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. 15 minutes left. Look at that. We broke some stereotypes here today. Got some time for Q&A. There it is. Awesome. Cool. So I'm gonna, I don't know if I pass it off to yeah, you or... No. Yeah, so we can just open it up for Q&A. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Preston Coles. I'm one of our student pastors here at Radiant. Um, pastor Zach and I get the honor of serving together here at Radiant and just um, more than anything, just humbled by what God's doing. But as I was sitting up here and as Phil was praying, I felt like he just spoke a power message and even had a whole ministry moment there at the end. So good. Um, but I was just feeling really for you guys. I know a lot of us, as Phil was asking at the beginning, kind of like our time in youth ministry and stuff. And I, having myself only been here for two years, but knowing, y'all, we've been through some crap this last year. We're exhausted, right? My, I never want to see a camera again. I never want to go on Instagram live again. My, like, I, like, I have a switch that when a, there's a camera in front of me, I get loud and extrovert, and it's, like, emotionally draining. And so I'm, like, if I have to do a four-minute Instagram live, I will pass out. Like, I'll be so... I'm so done. So I just know that, like, I, I, and I loved Phil's prayer over each and every one of you because a, a, a refilling, a refreshing, just I, my prayer is that you guys being here, even moments like we just had in worship, just spontaneous moments like that where the Holy Spirit's filling us up with a fresh fire, fresh energy, like, I think according to Phil's whole teaching, and I mean, that's something I think we've probably all been thinking about and why you're in this room. What is the next 10 years gonna look like? You know, it's, it's looked one way for the last decade, 20, 30 years, but we've shifted. Something's happened in our culture where we recognize, oh shoot, what got us here is not gonna get us there. You know, what's been happening is not gonna work anymore. It needs to shift and change. And so anyway, I love the hunger from you guys, but again, my prayer is that this weekend, well, not even weekend, Monday, Tuesday, is filling for you guys. Like, be refreshed, be renewed. Pray that you go back refueled, ready to go. Um, but yeah, so we'd love to just open it up for questions. Um, anybody, if you have them, and again, I mean, I think it can be anything in terms of strategy, action plans, any bit of Phil's four points, discipleship, parents, community. Yeah, Nate Lake. That's so real because the, the trigger word in ministry, right, is burnout, right? It's one that a lot of us have seen and people have experienced. Um, so the output or side of things to speak directly to it. So within the strategies is looking at the art of habit stacking, right? It's, it's building those habits and within the program of going like, hey, like this is where we're going to start, right? I think all of us have had those moments where we're like, here's this big goal, this thing that we're wanting to do. And then it's like not realizing the details that go into making something like that happen, right? Like I, I love talking to Miss Erica out here. I'm like, hey, how much goes into planning this conference? And she's like, oh, we start, like we're going to start planning for next year on Thursday. Like it's, it's one of those that the amount of that going into it. So when it comes to student discipleship, parent partnership, leader training, and community engagement, um, I would just challenge that, hey, what's, do the quick assessment, even if you're one person of going, what do, like where are we currently at? And assessing the reality of going like, hey, this is where we're at on the discipleship side. Here's those maybe some students that I can lean on. Um, when I was a volunteer youth pastor looking at where are some of those kids that can run a conversation that, you know, as we're setting up chairs together, 
we can walk through that. Hey, here's what this discussion is going to look like tonight. And to just like bring them with, um, I'll take kids grocery shopping with me uh, on a discipleship side. I'm looking for ways that, like I said, habit stacking that if I'm already doing this, who can I bring with on that one? Um, it is interesting though, Nate, I, le- I love that question because it, it's the three, like some of the most important things that we proclaim are the hardest to, to maintain in our schedule. Time with God, time with family, and time to sermon prep, right? Those are the things that people here would be like, man, we, I got to make sure this happens. But those are usually the first to go when it comes to ministry. So looking at what are some of the things that you're doing throughout your week that are natural, <clears throat> that you can just bring people with. And habit stacking is like, it's the building. Like, hey, this might be my goal. It's the Scott Wilson down in Texas has a great illustration of it. If there's a 20-foot goal that we're trying to accomplish, you know, sometimes we have too many, like, like three large steps and then it's like seems too big to even start. But then there's too many little ones that you're like, man, we're never going to get there. But it's identifying within your group of going like, hey, we got a group of 10 kids. We got a group of 30 kids. And I got two leaders that I maybe can count on. It's identifying that, hey, what is a step like, hey, by, by September, We'd like to be here. Hey, and then breaking it up into quarters. That's been something that's been really uh, helpful for us because then it takes away the pressure of going, I need to do this for in a year. And then it's like we lose track of it two months later, right? And so breaking up into quarters. Hey, quarter one, my goal for discipleship is this. My goal for leaders is this. And just breaking it down to make it bite size and, and building off those habits and looking for key moments to bring students and leaders along with you. Um, like I said, those games, like community engagement, I'll bring a leader with, and we'll connect with students. And there's like even discipleship moments that'll happen there while I'm waiting for a student to come out of the locker room. You're going like, hey man, like, and you're talking like for four quarters of a basketball game, and then it becomes, hey, so like, man, what's what are, you, what are kids in your school saying about this current situation? Like, what what are you hearing? And you start to, and then that helps me on my sermon prep side because I'm like, ooh, that's what they're all talking about. I actually know where they're at. So it's looking for ways to leverage what's already happening rather than feeling the pressure of creating from scratch in all those areas. Yeah. It changes each season. I think it's one that, um, and all of us have seasons, and I think we can fall into that rut of going, it has to be this way. But there's sometimes that um, when we got new, like new leaders or there's leaders that have left, that bringing them up to a place where they can shepherd in a way that reflects your heart. And so there are seasons that, you know, student like back to school, it's going to be heavy on student discipleship. It's getting those new students plugged in, making sure that there's a, a, a good spot there. And, and you know your ministry calendar as you're looking at that and identifying here's a spot where I'm making sure there's a touch point, maybe with parents, right? Like one of the things that's been good for us is I know Preston has PTSD with screens, um, but for us like parents, like we will pre-record a message with a staff member or a key parent volunteer, 15 minute conversation. We post it once a, once a month called our Parent Connect. And it's just a resource of like, hey, how to help talk about the Bible with my students. And that's not something it does. It takes maybe 45 minutes to an hour. And what we have found is we get more student volunteers then because parents are like, man, I love what you're doing. How can I help? Because you're bringing them in on the conversation with you. So looking for ways, once again, bite-sized things, not total like program overhaul, but little wins throughout a quarter that can help lead into it. So to answer your question directly, there's not a set way, leaders, students, parents, there's seasons that... It's my responsibility as a pastor, spiritual component aside, it's my job to make sure that I understand those rhythms and have a strategy that reflects those rhythms. Oh, that's a tough one. I've been in rooms with youth pastors that have argued this like it's politics, right? There's some that are like, hey, they need to be school-based. They need to be gender-based. They need to be like, hey, friend-based. And so um, one of the things that I found, talk to your pastor, like what's the heart of small groups from the top down? Because there's a favor that's hap- that happens when it's accompanying along the mission, the vision of the church. What we have found in our context is um, we want kids to want to be there. And so when it comes to, so it's more so of like the relationship base, um, but we are aware of the dark side that there is the dark side of that is it, it's very much a breeding ground for clicks. And so, and that clicks will happen regardless of any strategy. So it's identifying that what are, like, how will these clicks be formed? Will it be formed by the location and schools, by friends, by shared experiences within that group? And so, and that's one thing we will, youth ministry, it's like, 
or about relationships, clicks will form. It's our job to understand that how they're being formed and what we can do to continue to create on-ramps. So um, we do friendship-based, and then we do a shadow process. We have a long on-ramp for leaders. I, knew, I used to be, feel like this way, like, we just have to get leaders in. We have to get leaders in. And then also, like, one month later, they're like, actually, I'm not going to be here anymore. Bye. And then the kid's, like, left with, We're, I don't have a leader anymore. <laughs> like, so we have a long on-ramp. We have a shadow process. And there's a very uh, lengthy interview that I have with them. It's about a 15 to 30 minute interview because I want to make sure that they understand what we're asking of them. You know, there's gray areas that um, different contexts where it comes to uh, like some with the legalization of weed or there's alcohol, some of those gray areas with leaders. Even with stuff like that, we'll do like, hey, we're not even making it theological. We're just saying you're leading minors. And so we're just asking that in this context to choose not to do those things, regardless of what law might be out there, because we're leading minors, and we don't know if a kid is coming from an alcoholic background or a drug addiction, um, and we just want, because we know what we allow in um, uh, moderation will be done in excess. We've had high schoolers that will go like, oh, listen, I can handle my liquor better than my leader can. And it's like, no, that's not the conversation. Let's talk about Jesus, right? And so but within that process, I say that to circle back to how do we place them in there. There is a shadow process that is a part of a interview process, and we embrace the awkward of it being longer than I might like because I have found they stay longer. And uh, one of the things that with the average youth pastor staying at a church 18 months, Pew Research, 18 months is the average length of a youth pastor. My goal is like, we, I want to have a leader that's there for three years. I'm not asking for a three-year commitment. So to do that, for us, like I said, it could work different in other ways. Students are forming groups based off friendship interest groups. And then leaders, based off, like, as they shadow, which groups that they connect with. Because we want them to want to be there. And then, so that's how we have done it. I've heard, once again, groups that have dozens and dozens of small groups that do it based off schools, based off other things like that. But that's how we have done it. And that's something that we have found that has created some great on-roads to create those safe environments for conversations. That is a great question. I remember the days in youth group where I'm like, I don't know if anybody's going to show up. Like, I'm planning all this. I don't, like, we could have zero kids in the room right now. And then the kids that show up, you're like, oh, I'm going to have to babysit you more so than actually preach to you, right? Like, it's like your parents gave you sugar before you came in here. Um, that gap, man, it's re one of the things, if it's a smaller group that we have found, um, do you have any volunteers? I just got six. Yeah. You got six? That's awesome, though. Dude, let's just celebrate. You got like, listen. There's people in there. We got there's people with zero. Okay, so that's six. Oh, look at you. Okay, creating creating that culture. I love it. What I would look at. Um, there have been ministries, uh, some models that I've seen that have been that have helped navigate that. It's like some of your your younger students. It might be, hey, we're gonna worship together, and then the ninth or like eighth grade and below, they're gonna go with these couple leaders, and they're gonna have a small group conversation while I preach. Then to the large or the older kids. And then there's a, a flip-flop because we understand middle school is asking, what do I believe? High school is asking, asking, what are the doubts of what I believe? And so there's even questions there. So having those separate contexts now that it challenges us because we have to make sure we hit our time then. So one's not going 45 minutes and then we're, and the other one's like 30 minutes. But it's understanding that maybe it's providing different outlets for that. So we've done that in the past. And that's worked. Um, it's forced me, though, to make sure I'm communicating with my leaders ahead of time and empowering them in a way that they're like, hey, for 30 minutes, pastor's not here. I'm not going to lose any of these kids. Like, I got this, right? And so that's one model that I've seen done well. But also just the small, like, embracing that small group model of just having some of those conversations. And it's okay if it doesn't look like some of the services right away. As you are building, once again, that habit stacking idea of going like, hey, I want to teach them how to have conversations about Jesus. I want them to feel safe enough to ask questions about Jesus. 
And if it's a smaller group, that might just be the, the model as well. So either like separating them or just getting in that small group, maybe empowering some of those 11th and 12th graders to, to hop in on some of those conversations as you trust them. <laughs> Well, it's 12.30. I want to respect the lunch time. It's actually a minute before 12.30. Um, I will stay in here, though. If there's any other questions, would love to, to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, grateful for you guys. Thanks for what you do. Appreciate you. Enjoy lunch and enjoy the rest of the conference.